bad night of sleep is going to magnify your weak spots, your vulnerabilities. So if you have a vulnerability to depression, bad night of sleep is going to, to amplify that. And, and even for people without that vulnerability, we know that a bad night of sleep attempts to amplify negative emotions and minimize positive emotions. Welcome back everyone to the Geeks, Geezers, and Googleization Show, the home of Googleization Nation, where we talk with HR and business thought leaders about the crazy shift going on all around us and explore the disruptive convergence of technology, business, and people. Here are your hosts, Ira Wolf and Jason Cochran. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Geek Skeezers and Googleization, a show from the People Forward Network. I'm Ira Wolf, and thank you for being part of Googleization Nation. And I'm Jason Cochran. If you think this is just another podcast, think again. We are the voice of the most important, crucial conversations that are confronting business leaders and people today. Our goal is to bring you ways to reimagine tomorrow and explore the impact and convergence of business, technology, and people. This episode of Geek Skeezers and Googleization is sponsored by our partner, Y Institute, your personal and professional GPS for a meaningful life and purpose-filled career. You'll hear more about the Y operating system and the Y Institute a little later on in the show. So Jason, maybe it's just me being the older baby boomer in the group, but I grew up during a time when sleep was certainly overrated and sleep deprivation was not something we talked about, but it was also almost a badge of courage. When we heard that almost one third of our lives we spend sleeping, the response wasn't, oh, that's time well spent, but more like, what a waste of time. And from all nighters in college to running on four to five hours sleep each night just a few years ago, I too wore little or no sleep as a badge of courage. Uh, you know, people looked at it as uh, kind of hard work and gritty and stick to itiveness and you get things done. But and then when, you know, every now and then you would make I'd make a mistake or an accident happened. No, nothing serious, but something um, I might have overlooked. Uh, and their first response of other people was always, uh, oh, you're just tired. Uh, we all make mistakes. Oh, don't worry about it. And I'd go on my merry way and and say, hey, it was my goal was achieved. I got everything done. But like drugs, sleep deprivation is harmful. And instead of treating it like the condition that it is or a, or a problem, we treat the symptoms. Uh, but thank goodness for experts like Dr. Phil German, who we're going to hear from today. Uh, he's helping us learn about the critical role sleep plays, not only in our physical health, but also our emotional and mental well-being, which has certainly uh, gotten the headlines uh, ever since uh, the pandemic. And he's got an important message for our leaders and executives, too. So don't think this is just for all the workers, because for those executives who think that time and a half or double pay compensate, double pay uh, wages compensates for starving their workers from sleep. Uh, Dr. Phil will be joining us in just a few minutes. But first, it's time for our perfect labor storm. So on each, we, on each episode, we focus on just one disruptive, surprising, or worrisome trend that we believe you should know. According to the CDC, in a recent report just out uh, September 2020, more than one in every three Americans are sleep deprived, one third. According to the Sleep Foundation, nurses, just as an example of how this impacts people, nurses who work 12 and a half hour shifts report committing more than three times as many medical errors than those working only an eight, uh, eight and a half hour shift. Uh, I've got a sister-in-law who often is putting in close to 24-hour shifts because they're shorthanded uh, and they're working day after day. So according to the U.S. News and World Report sleep quality study that just came out in 2022, here's what's keeping Americans awake at night. 41% uh, worry about inflation, 39% about COVID, 27% 
about gun violence, 22% worry about climate change, and 22% also worry about the Russian-Ukraine war. But I'm going to add one to that. Just um, a night or two ago, I woke up about 4.30, and very honestly, I wasn't thinking about any of those. Um, but I was thinking about all the things that I needed to get done for today. I was teaching a class. I had a lot of meetings. We're planning this podcast. We've got a live stream coming up tomorrow. Uh, and then uh, we're, I'm traveling for a few days. So I had all these things. So I woke up at five, four in the morning, couldn't get things done. And, you know, frankly, I was sleep deprived, uh, uh, you know, for a day or so. Uh, in the past, I would just blow it off. Now it takes its toll. And uh, we're going to hear about that today from Dr. Phil German. Ari, and it sounds like a lot of us, we struggle when it comes to quality sleep uh, in our lives. And for me personally, I, I go back to when uh, my wife and I had our twin sons, um, which was two and a half years ago. We have four sons who are under the age of eight. And when we had the twins, um, between the other two boys getting up during the night and, of course, the twins, it's lucky if we got an hour of uninterrupted sleep at a time um, during the night. And so no doubt today's episode with Dr. Gehrman is going to serve as a wake up call for our sleeping patterns. And those perfect labor storm data that you shared are a perfect example of us not really understanding its impact on our work life as well. Sometimes would we really want to put our life in the hands of sleep deprived medical staff who are three times more likely to make a critical error regarding our health? The obvious answer we'd all say is no. Uh, but sadly, in our society, we're still, we still tend to reward uh, those who stay up working or socializing past the time that they should go to sleep. And in fact, I heard just last week, there were viral posts from an employee at Twitter who shared images of his manager in a sleeping bag on the floor with a sleeping mask on, trying to keep up with the impulsive demands and unrealistic deadlines placed on them by the new owner, Elon Musk. And I got to say, it reminds me of a scene in the Star Wars movie Revenge of the Sith when the Supreme Chancellor Palpatine announced the emergence of the Galactic Empire with him at the helm. And Senator Padme Amidala, this is uh, the character played by Natalie Portman, she famously says in that scene, so this is how liberty dies, with thunderous applause. Kind of feels like we're having that type of moment for sleep on display last week at the expense of Twitter staff. But what's clear with sleep is that instead of sacrificing it being viewed as a badge of honor, like you mentioned, we should view sacrificing sleep as a scarlet letter instead. And Jason, I don't know if you uh, saw the headlines this morning, but uh, uh, Elon Musk put the hammer down even further. So he's demanding that people have to work harder. Before we bring on Dr. Philip German, I just want to remind everybody that if you're not a member of Googleization Nation, please go up to the site, googleizationnation.com. Uh, it's free, um, but you can also earn CHRM credits. Um, you don't have to belong to, to, to Googleization Nation, but if you, we hope you do. Uh, but you can earn CHRM credits. Uh, simply go up to the site, googleizationnation.com, uh, click on podcast. There is a, a form there under podcast, uh, quick form. We ask you a few questions just to make sure that you actually listened or watched the show. And in return, in response, we will send you the activity code that you can submit to CHRM uh, for anywhere between a half to a full credit. Uh, and while you, if you are listening to this on Apple or Spotify or iHeart or Amazon, uh, please leave a review and, and rate us. Uh, we're now in the top 1% and we just passed a huge milestone of 100,000 downloads and climbing. So uh, we welcome everyone, but we want to know how we can do better. And if we're doing a good job, please let us know. Absolutely. Incredible milestones there. And so without further ado, perfect time to bring on today's guest, Dr. Philip Gehrman from the University of Pennsylvania. We are going to learn all about sleep and health and work today. So let's welcome you. Great way to start. It's so obviously, Phil, you know, you, you heard us sharing a lot of data there. But before we get into some of the, the meat and potatoes around sleep, uh, you probably get asked this question quite a bit. How did you become a sleep doctor? How did you get on this journey of becoming one of the most respected minds in the world on sleep? Now, it's a great question. Um, it actually comes down to a single class in college. So I, I was studying psychology. 
uh, as an undergraduate and my senior year, I was looking to register and there was a class offered on sleep. And I thought, well, that's not really something I, I give much thought to. And, um, and this was, I mean, this is early 1990s, so it was not really a topic that was on most people's radar screen at that point. And so I decided to enroll in the class and in one of the very first lectures, um, the professor was, was giving the statistic you were referring to a moment ago, Ira, the fact that we spend a third of our lives sleeping. And I had never really done that math before. And I started, it, we wanted to know, well, well, then what was it for? And this was in the early days of the field of sleep research. And there just wasn't very much known. So just, uh, I was just, I was intrigued by that class. And uh, I, when I went to graduate, I worked in a sleep lab for a couple of years. Then I went to graduate school in psychology and specifically sought out programs where I could continue to study sleep. So it really goes back to that one class in college. And I think for me, I got my degree in psychology as well. And the first time I took a psychology class, I was immediately hooked, um, you know, mm -hmm. trying to learn, you know, how people perform best and, and understanding their behavior. And so th this whole world of sleep now, you know, you heard us go through a lot of the data. Um, and it sounds like, you know, I mentioned, it sounds like most of us suck at sleeping, unfortunately. <laughs> and Ira said, <laughs> You know, most of the time on this show, we talk about the reasons we suck at it. But for, from what you've seen in, in your expertise and the research that you've done, can you kind of paint the picture of, of where we are as a society when it comes to our relationship with sleep? Yeah, it's pretty bad, as you indicated. I mean, it is definitely improving. So there's, there's definitely a much greater awareness of the importance of sleep and rest uh, than there was even just five or 10 years ago. So, so I feel like it's on people's radar screens a lot more than it was. But if you look at people's actual behavior and the amount of time they're spending sleeping, it really hasn't budged much. Um, so I think the, the the desire is there more so than the past, but in terms of action, um, we're, we're still not seeing it. Phil, I think the association was, and there certainly was my exposure, you know, I shared right before the show that for a few years, I was actually a VP of a hospital and one of my departments was sleep. So I got to learn a lot uh, about it, but I think most people might associate the you know, maybe the disease of sleep or, or the conditions associated with sleep apnea, uh, snoring, you know, oftentimes it's not, oh, it doesn't bother me, but it bothers my spouse or partner or girlfriend, their boyfriend or whatever that is. And, but the, the implications, I mean, it's, it's really a, a serious health problem. I think it goes beyond that. So one is I'd like you to address that, your perspective, but then let's take it to the next step that you don't have to have sleep apnea to be sleep deprived. Yeah, and I'm glad you made that distinction because I, I often make that same distinction. I say, you know, we have, we have two buckets here. One bucket is people who are trying to get a good night of sleep and, you know, they're spending enough time in bed, but because of one or more sleep disorders, they're just unable to get the quantity and quality of sleep that they need to feel rested. Sleep apnea is, is in that category and it has gotten a lot of attention because the, the, the rapid recognition of the high prevalence of sleep apnea really was one of the driving, maybe the driving factor in the growth of sleep medicine as a specialty. We're starting to see more of an, a focus on the insomnia side of things, which is more of my expertise, uh, in part because insomnia is more prevalent than sleep apnea and, uh, and rates are, are definitely increasing. And so, so there's the sleep disorders but, uh, bucket. The other bucket is more of kind of the choices that we make surrounding sleep. And what I mean by that is we know that, you know, the majority of people, they don't have any difficulty sleeping. They're just not spending enough time in bed uh, or they're not getting sufficient quality of sleep for one or more factors that are in their control. So there's like the sleep disorder side, and then there's more the sleep behavior side as well. And Phil, a follow up to that. Obviously, we've gone through a, a a massive change in how we work, right? Since COVID, like there's so many more people now that are doing either hybrid work schedules or they're working remotely from home. What, if anything, are are you seeing or hearing in relation to sleep with more people being able to possibly work from home now? Is it helping the situation? Is it making it more challenging because now personal life and work life are 
bombarding each other more commonly? What are you seeing or hearing in relation to remote work and sleep? Yeah, it's really both sides uh, of the coin that on the positive side, because people are spending less time commuting, um, we're finding there's a subset of people who are actually sleeping better because they don't have to wake up quite as early in the morning. They just have to get up you know, early enough to get ready, but without that 30, 60 minute commute. So there are those some people who are actually getting more sleep uh, because of uh, the working virtually. On the negative side of things, one is just the overall increased stress levels everybody's been experiencing. And of course, when we're under stress, sleep is typically one of the first things impacted. But then there is that kind of difficulty separating work and home life and home and personal life. So for example, uh, for a lot of people, their office is a corner of their bedroom. And so they spend all day in their bedroom working, maybe you know, pretty stressed out. And so that room now gets associated with work and tension. Then they finish the work day, but then a couple of few hours later, they go into that room to sleep that their mind is seeing this as a work stressful place, not as a place for relaxation and rest. And um, so that there's just, there, there's that, that there's definitely seeing that that lack of separation between work and personal space is impacting sleep for some people. That's fascinating. And I can attest even outside of the sleep context, uh, my wife often gets frustrated with how often I'm at home <laughs> coming out, getting a snack, uh, getting a drink or something. And there's many days where she wishes I would just be away at the office. Um, so I, that what you just shared makes a tremendous amount of sense to me. Yeah, Phil, as, as I'm going through this, I mean, there's so many examples that I'm sure go through other minds, everyone's mind. So Jason mentioned, you know, he's got four young boys uh, mm -hmm. and you know, even when they're all healthy and going, that could be a, a challenge getting a good night's sleep. Uh, but we're right now, we've got my son and, and daughter-in-law and a three-year-old, a one-year-old and three dogs and a hermit crab. <laughs> uh, the hermit crab, we don't know if he <laughs> has any symptoms. The three dogs are just getting old and they bark. Uh, but the two boys, um, you know, have been sick on the childhood stuff, you know, and they go to school, they're around mm -hmm. people. Uh, we had the flu running through, you know, the household, we pass it around. Um, but, you know, so as adults, we just hide away in the bedroom. But the, mm -hmm. the, the young kids are up all night. And so yeah. we've got two working parents that are really struggling and two grandparents <laughs> that, that, are, mm -hmm. that are trying to stay out of the way. Uh, how do people, I mean, I don't know if there's any good tips, but how do you manage, how do you sort of recoup that? Because there's no chance to just say, oh, I've got to sleep through the night or, or, or they yeah. can't even take medication. I mean, they can't even take anything to, re to relax, to, to get out of that mm -hmm. cycle. But I'm, I, I know that's going on in the, in, the head, in the minds of many people. So it certainly highlights the fact that sleep is a family affair, that you know, when, when we live in the context of a family in our, in our home, the sleep of one person uh, and their patterns impacts the other people in the household. And, and I'll add, not just at night, there's the whole daytime angle as well, that if one person's not sleeping well and they're irritable during the day, well, that's going to affect the quality of the, the home life a, as well. So there's both nighttime and daytime repercussions. Uh, and I think it really emphasizes the importance of, as a household, Kind of valuing sleep and kind of making sleep a, a priority. Um, and I always say, so I have two teenage kids and they have been kind of hammered in the importance of a good night of sleep since they were, they were young. And so, so they've been hearing this message for, for a lot of, a long time. And so they've learned how to make sleep a priority in their schedules uh, as well. Uh, now, when there's, and I think when sleep's normally a priority and it's good. people are generally getting a decent night of rest. Then when the sickness comes around, when there's a lot going on, whatever it may be, there may be short term periods where the family as a whole is not getting as, not as much sleep. But when you're starting from a baseline of a good night of sleep, it makes it much easier to tolerate those disruptions. Yeah. And that makes sense. Obviously, if you're getting a good night's sleep, hopefully you're healthier 
versus not that mm -hmm. your resistance is pretty fragile and mm -hmm. run down and you're and uh yeah. you know when that bug does come around uh you're you're a lot less vulnerable uh going back yeah. to something you said though uh, you know we talked about it we, we touched on it a little bit earlier you know we have sleep apnea so people know and again just for it you you can clarify me but just because mm -hmm. you snore doesn't mean you have sleep apnea I mean, um, but sleep apnea is very, very serious because you stop breathing at, at different times, mm -hmm. which causes heart problems and strokes. And and it, it, it just exacerbates, you know, other common problems like we have, like, high blood, you know, hypertension and diabetes. So mm -hmm. there's a whole series of that. But we talk about insomnia. So what what are mm -hmm. some of the symptoms? I mean, other than irritability and anxious anxiety mm -hmm. and stress that we might that that might be symptoms of insomnia because that's different. Mm -hmm. That I, I'll assume is just different than just being tired. Absolutely. Yeah, the, the definition of insomnia is, is pretty simple. One, you have difficulty falling or staying asleep. So it's, you're, you're getting into bed and it's taking you a long time to fall asleep. You're waking up in the middle of the night and you're having difficulty getting back to sleep. And then the second piece is it's causing, is negatively impacting you in some way, either from that irritability, from tiredness, uh, difficulty concentrating or focusing. It's kind of a million ways that insomnia can impact people during the day. Now, um, we don't make a formal diagnosis of insomnia until it's been going on at least three months. So the majority of people are gonna have insomnia for a week, a few weeks, a month or two, and then their sleep will get back to normal. And so they might have these short term periods. But when it's been going on three months or longer is when we now say, no, this is now a chronic problem that probably warrants uh, treatment. Is is there a, a period of time, I mean, from insomnia, as I said, I gave you the example the other day, I kind of went to bed at, you know, we, we usually go to bed about midnight, but I got up at four and staring at the clock. And it's like, mm -hmm. oh, I'm gonna go back to sleep, back to sleep and go, oh, forget it. I, I can get more work done. And, and, and so I got up. So that's one night. But so obviously under th less than three months, that doesn't qualify for insomnia. Uh, but, right. you know, if that was happening for, you know, 12 weeks, then mm -hmm. what do I do? I mean, wh wh yeah. what's, what's my call? Because I, I it, you know, certainly the fear would be if I, if I call the doctor, if I go to somebody, mm -hmm. what are they going to do for me? They can't make yeah. all the problems go away. <laughs> Right. Yeah, I, I'd say that there's, there's a few steps to take is one to try to figure out what's causing my insomnia and the stress is definitely going to be the number one reason. And so if it's if someone's insomnia is a direct result of stress they're experiencing, then the focus should be on the stress. Are there any ways to reduce the sources of stress? Are there ways that I can you know, learn strategies for coping with stress better? Uh, now, what we know happens for a lot of people is maybe it was the stress that first caused the insomnia. But over time, insomnia starts to take on a life of its own. Uh, and I, I always like to, to use this example of someone I spoke to a number of years ago who told me they started having insomnia after losing their job. And so it was a stressful period in their life. And um, no, no, I'm not surprised they couldn't sleep. And But I asked when that happened. And they said, well, that was about 30 years ago. I said, have you been unemployed for 30 years? He said, no, no, I was unemployed about six months. I got a new job. I've been happily employed ever since, but my sleep never got back on track. And so there's this point at which the, like I said, the insomnia kind of becomes its own thing. And it kind of this self-perpetuating cycle that people get stuck into. Once that pattern develops, it's usually not gonna go away on its own. And it is worth talking to a healthcare provider. Now, I will say one of the reasons people often don't raise it with their healthcare providers is they think the only option is they're going to give me a pill, and uh, and I don't really want to take a medication for it. And but the what people often are not aware of is there are non-medication approaches to treating insomnia as well. And so, so I'm a psychologist. I'm not a prescriber. Uh, when I treat people with insomnia, what I use is what's called cognitive behavioral treatment, which is a, a non-medication strategy that actually works well for a lot of people for improving their insomnia. So, so it's important for people to understand that uh, medications are not the only option out there. 
And and Phil, this also brings up the question you brought in. You know that perfect example of someone who thirty years ago, you know they they lost their job, but it, you know still impacting their sleep and they need some support. Thinking about this through the lens of employers, we've got a lot of stressed people. Obviously, we went through the data sure. earlier, especially since COVID, where the world's been flipped upside down. People are asking themselves big questions about their life, mm -hmm. existential questions of the type of work that they do. They're trying to figure out how to work. Do I work from home? Do I go into the office? What are some things that employers, managers, leaders can be doing that's within their control that 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 can help maybe set up a culture of valuing sleep inside the organization? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, and there's a lot I think that employers can do. I, can, I could talk about that all day, but I think one is kind of, as you're saying, creating a culture in which sleep is valued. And that may be as simple as, you know, some employers create rules for what the earliest in the morning meetings are allowed to be scheduled. And, uh, and so, and, and how late in the day as well. So sometimes it's, it's creating policies that say, um, we don't want your work hours to start spreading out into your sleep time and interfering with it. So we're going to try to set some intentional boundaries to try to protect that time. Um, the, it, uh, uh, some of it is the, the work schedules that people follow. So as I was saying earlier, there are some people who are sleeping better during the pandemic because they're able to follow their body's own natural cycle. So, so we all have this internal rhythm, what we call our circadian rhythms, where some people are more of a night owl, some people like me are more of a morning person, it's kind of some people are in the middle. And we know people are going to get the best sleep when they can follow their body's natural rhythm. So is there flexibility in the work schedule to give people flexible hours, some degree of flexibility, where maybe the night owl can sleep in a little bit in the morning, come into work later and stay later, they're going to be more rested, more productive because they're able to follow their body's natural cycle. And so, so is there room for flexibility and schedules to accommodate people's individual sleep needs? Um, of course, I can't talk about policies uh, around work without talking about shift work. You know, roughly one in, almost one in four workers in the U.S does some degree of shift work, whether that's second shift in the evening, overnight shift. And we've known for a very long time that shift workers often sleep very poorly, especially if their work schedules are, are changing frequently. And so, so there's a lot that be, can be done in the context of, of what we call rational shift work schedules. Shift work is always going to be there, but it can be, there are good ways to do it and there are bad ways to do it. Um, are, are you listening, Elon? <laughs> right. <laughs> so, um, but for our listeners who are listening, uh, you're listening to the Geek Skeezers and Googleization show. Uh, we've got Dr. Phil German today. Uh, we're talking about sleep. Fascinating subject. Uh, I've got, the, I can't say a background on it, but a little bit of knowledge. It's a dangerous thing about it, but uh, learning, learning a lot today. So we're going to continue this conversation, especially how uh, companies and leaders can it can help employees what the importance of having good sleep patterns is. Uh, I, I love the saying, uh, Phil, that you that you mentioned earlier, sleep is a family affair. Well, I guess it could be a company affair, you know, or a business affair as well. And that may be the title of the podcast. We may switch it up a little bit, uh, but we're going to take a quick break. We will be right back. Uh, stay tuned and we will continue this conversation and find out uh, what's next. You know, what what's uh, Phil working on in his research and uh, what's what's around the corner? Stay tuned. For most of us, change is freaking terrifying. And unfortunately, there's no app to adapt. That might change in the not so distant future, but for now, we're on our own. That means we can either accept our default future or reimagine our tomorrow. For those of you who choose default, good luck. Just remember, there's no pause button for change. You can't turn back the clock. And there's no get out of jail free card in this age of perpetual uncertainty. Like it or not, change will happen all around us. And that change is not becoming just more disruptive and frequent, but volatile, uncertain, 
complex and ambiguous, or VUCA. Fortunately, you can make change work for you and turn it into your personal and competitive advantage. Reimagine your future to one in which you're living with purpose, you're happy, and you're growing, thriving, and flourishing. If you're ready to rewrite your next life chapter and regain control of your destiny in this never normal world, your journey starts here. Contact the leader in adaptability and making change work for you, your team, and your organization. Ira S. Wolf, adaptability.expert. There's a certain kind of coach who believes what we believe, who leads people to greatness, who gets people unstuck, who unlocks all of your passion. A coach who helps people discover what drives them to tap into their superpowers. Then knowing your why is the first step to untap potential, to focus, to breakthroughs. A coach who's looking for a better way. Are you that coach? Hey, welcome back, everyone, to Geek Skeezers and Googleization. We're here. We're talking about sleep today. Something that uh, in the in the past, you know, many have said, you know, it's it's overrated. Who needs it? Or or wore that two or three hours of, of sleep a night as a badge of courage. Uh, we're finding out all the ill effects, and that's not necessarily the best thing. Uh, and with so much focus on well being. Uh, employees wanting not only a flexibility, but they want a better lifestyle, the old baby boomer and prior to that, uh, that we work to live or, or we live to work uh, is now becoming work to live. And uh, so what can companies do? How can companies address this? How do they recognize that? So one of the things that uh, I you know, that I see many companies, they've talked about it for years, but now they tend to be offering it again, is taking naps <laughs> during the day. Um, and I guess my cynical side would say, is that just a gimmick? It's like, Hey, you can take, you know, everybody can take a, f a half hour sleep nap or we have a sleep room, but it's only, you know, it's, it's only for a half hour and then you're going to be penalized, which may not fit everybody's cycle because some people may, may, may want that. Some people just may be overtired because they spent, they were up all night partying. Um, so, you know, how, what are some of the good benefits or were some of the good changes that organizations could make? I guess answering the question is, is carving out nap time good in the workplace? So I think naps can be part of the equation. I, I think you're right that, that there's certainly not a panacea. And um, what we know is that uh, naps during the day can be good and they can be bad. Um, I often say that napping during the day is like snacking between meals. So if you have a, a big snack that for your next meal, you're just not going to be as hungry because you've kind of ruined your appetite. Napping can do the same thing where sometimes people get into the cycle where they're not sleeping well at night. So they nap during the day, but they're taking long naps and now they're not as tired at night. So it's harder to sleep and it kind of fuels this cycle. But research is showing that short naps the kind of the idea of a power nap, 15 to 20, maybe 30 minutes max, maybe long enough to give us a boost in our alertness, but short enough that it's not likely to interfere with our ability to sleep at night. Uh, and, and of course, we a lot of us have had the experience of if you take a long nap, like getting to like an hour or more, often you actually feel worse after a long nap rather than better. So I think I, I would call it strategic napping. Strategic napping can play a role, um, but there are a lot of people who will say, you know, I just can't nap during the day. No matter how tired I, are, I am, I'm just not a napper. Phil, I love that strategic napping. Uh, all of our listeners are going to have to add that into their lexicon of what they use. And I got to say, I must be a strategic napper because I'm one of the people I can take a two or three hour nap. I feel great. I could take a 20 minute nap. I feel great. I don't know what it is, but I absolutely love mm -hmm. napping. But this kind of segues into another question I have for you is there's a lot of talk about meditation right now. Everywhere you turn, you know, this talk about how you treat burnout, how you deal with your stress, you just need to meditate. 
I'm sure there's no doubt that meditation is good for you, but is it ever a replacement for sleep or for naps? Or does it provide any of the same benefits of sleep where it would be a substitute for getting the amount of sleep that you need? Yeah, there are definitely claims in the research that meditation can produce a state that is comparable to sleep and may be equally beneficial. Uh, the evidence is certainly not strong and even if that is possible, it's probably only for the kind of the upper echelon of really good meditators. But my kind of cynical response is, well, if you're going to spend that much time meditating, just spend that time sleeping. <laughs> and, and so it may, there may be some value for a small subset of people, but I think for the overwhelming majority, there's just no substitute for quantity and quality of sleep. And with sleep, uh, Phil, we haven't gotten into much of your research, but are there some some things that are kind of around the corner, things that you're currently working on that are groundbreaking when it comes to um, sleep? Yeah. So a lot of what my research is focused on is the important role of, of a good night of sleep for, for our mental health and well-being. Uh, we've known for decades that people who are experiencing a lot of anxiety or feeling depressed, um, you know, other mental health symptoms frequently don't have trouble sleeping. And from years of research, we've now shown that actually the arrow goes in the other direction as well, that when you're not sleeping well, it actually increases your likelihood of developing anxiety, developing depression. Uh, I mean, we, we know that for some people, they start using drugs or alcohol to help them sleep, and then they develop a dependence on those uh, things. So. Uh, I often say that could a, a bad night of sleep is going to magnify your weak spots, your vulnerabilities. So if you have a vulnerability to depression, bad night of sleep is going to amplify that. And, and even for people without that vulnerability, we know that a bad night of sleep tends to amplify negative emotions and minimize positive emotions. So we, we just tend to just feel blah after a poor night of sleep. Um, and so, so we're really trying to understand like, well, what are some of the changes going on in the brain that, and in the body, throughout the body that are responsible for these associations? Because the kind of the, it, I'm, I'm a firm believer that uh, sleep is, I often refer to sleep as our emotional barometer, that how we're sleeping can be an indication of our overall emotional mental state. So if we paid enough attention to sleep, it could indicate one, when maybe we're starting to develop other mental health problems that warrant attention. But then conversely, if we can help people sleep better, can we actually reduce their risk of, of developing mental health problems in the first place and really promote positive mental health through a good night of sleep? So that's, that's really the focus of a lot of our work. And thinking into the future, I've got to ask this question around the metaverse. Do you ever anticipate there's going to be treatment or, or what will sleep possibly look like in the metaverse in the future? Yeah. So the, there have been quite a few people who have embraced digital approaches to helping people sleep better, whether it's all the apps and the wearables that kind of do sleep coaching and try to, to help you get a better night of sleep, or even for full-blown treatment of, of insomnia and other sleep problems, there are digital versions, whether through kind of internet platforms or um, through through apps or, or different different approaches, so I think the digitization digitization of sleep treatment and sleep coaching is already here. And um, the I think where, it, in my opinion, the claims maybe outpace the actual data is, uh, in my, we just don't have a good sense for a lot of say the wearable devices or like the, these algorithms, these sleep treatment programs are only as good as the data that are used to inform them. And I think there's a, a lot of room for improving the quality of that data and, and really being able to take a comprehensive approach of understanding how someone is sleeping, but also how that sleep fits into the context of their life as well. So, so I think we're off to a good start in terms of this, this being in, in di different digital uh, approaches, but, uh, but I think we have a ways to go. Well, that ties into the future of work, doesn't it, Jason? Uh, tr treating sleep disorders <laughs> with algorithms. <laughs>
So that, that, <laughs> Absolutely. that, that sort of makes the, the, the giant bridge. How does this fit into our conversation? Uh, Phil, we're, we're approaching toward the end. And again, I know we have a lot of uh, HR leaders, business leaders. Uh, that was the focus of the show. How does this affect their ability? Uh, hopefully we raise the awareness uh, of them, why it's important and why they should care if their employees are sleeping uh, and rested. What If there were three things to say, where do I start? So I'm a leader, I've heard this, I never thought of all this before, I, and, I, and I really wanna do good for my employees, where, where, what are kind of three tips or what more well, doesn't have to be only three, but yeah. where would I start? I think number one would just be, be taking stock of, of where you and your employees are at as far as this, your sleep is concerned. And this could be just through communication with employees. It could be a formal kind of survey that goes out to employees to say, you know, how are you doing as far as sleep is concerned? How are you feeling during the day? How is that impacting? Uh, your ability to to enjoy work and, and your personal life. So, so I think evaluating where they're at right now. It's possible they might find everything's great. All of our employees are, are sleeping well, in, in which case, great, keep doing what you're doing. I think the more common, more likely scenario is that they're going to find they have a lot of tired employees. So I think step two is to try to figure out what is it about our, our work practices, our work policies that maybe is contributing to those sleep problems? And because obviously it's not just work-related factors that drive people's sleep problems, but I think they can evaluate how, how are we contributing to the problem? And are there, that can then lead to kind of identification of changes to policies, to procedures, to work schedules, whatever it may be, that might uh, help to encourage and foster a healthy culture of sleep and more rested uh, employees. And, uh, and I think I'll also add in there, uh, when it comes to like the sleep disorders, I know more and more uh, EAP programs, for example, are starting to incorporate kind of sleep focused treatments and, and, and assessments for their employees. So, so I, I, I think seeing the extent to which offering those services uh, would be beneficial for employees and, and ultimately for the company. I mean, rested employees are gonna be happier. They're gonna be more productive. They're gonna produce better quality work. Before we, before we get to our lightning round here, um, because we're, we're, you know, we're pretty close to wrapping up, uh, we always like ask, would like to ask the guest one question, and and I, I I find myself asking this all the time. What is one thing that we should have asked you, but that we didn't? <laughs> oh, good question. I mean, I think you've asked some some really good questions. I guess um, um, maybe just I think one of the things that employers can often feel is that they know everybody's sleep deprived and is uh, it, it may feel overwhelming. Like, how am I really going to be able to, to encourage and, and make changes to help all, all, my, all of my employees sleep well? Um, what I like to emphasize is the fact that this does not necessarily need to be huge leaps, that uh, people's sleep patterns, their sleep habits did not get to where they are right now overnight. And so, it could be just making small changes one at a time over time can move the, the workplace into a healthier culture of sleep. So I think just an awareness that this is not an all or none pro um, proposition, that this can be a journey that companies go on towards improving the sleep of their employees. Perfect. Well, I can't believe we've already come to the end of the show, Phil, but before we let you go, We've got to do our lightning round so we can get to know you a little bit better and help our audience get to know you better too. So just going to ask you a few questions here, some softball questions to uh, to get to okay. know you a little bit better. But let's start with this one. Okay, I'm ready. So so we got to ask the, the sleep doctor. We've got you here. I'm not going to ask you about a nightmare, but maybe what's one of your biggest fears? Hmm. Um, well, my, my first child is off to college, and so she's out of the house, and there's a lot of unknown of what's been kind of going on in her, in her life. And um, so, you know, I, I certainly have had a few nights since she started of kind of lying awake at night wondering kind of what she's doing and, and, and is she safe and is she okay? So I think, you know, thinking about the well-being of my family is, is, is certainly something that can keep me up, 
here and there. How about, uh, let's go this direction. Let's go more of a positive route now. How about a favorite band or uh, a favorite musician? Mm, I'd have to say um, the group uh, uh, Third Day is, is the one. I like a, a wide array of music, but there's a, a group called Third Day who uh, is probably even the most consistent that I've listened to over the years. I used to listen to them quite a bit when I was in Nashville, Tennessee. I'm going to college. Oh, okay. Yeah, I really like them. Uh, and then uh, yeah. how about if, if you could pick any place in the world where you could go mm -hmm. tomorrow, where mm -hmm. would you go? Hmm. Pre-pandemic, I used to give an annual two-day training workshop for mental health providers in Florence, Italy. And uh, it, it's just hard to to be Florence or really just about anywhere in, in Italy. Uh, you know, if I had to relocate outside of the U.S., I certainly would be tempted to move there. So, uh, so I'd say Florence would definitely be high on the list. I love that. And uh, let's do one more. Let, let's find out what your favorite superpower would be if you could choose one. Mm. Oh, that's a, that's a hard one. I think I'd say um, I would like to have a super memory, I think, because I, I do a lot, I spend a lot of time reading, you know, research and, you know, different things. And, you know, 80% of what I read, I then forget. And I just feel like you know, if I could just remember all the, the work that I read and that I do, um, I could maybe take my research to to another level. And I, I think super memory would help me in so many ways, both professionally and personally. And we can call you Watson. <laughs> that's right that's right and my wife would vote for that one for me because she gives me a list of like three things at the grocery store i'll be like i remember it you don't need to write it down for me the moment i step foot inside the grocery store i forget it and i start going down the cookie and candy aisle so super memory would come in super handy for me too well phil this has been a blast thank you so much for coming on with us today helping us understand the science your expertise your insights of sleep and then tying that into how it's important for all of us and what employers can do to help with this as yeah. well. Um, what's the best way that folks can get in touch with you and learn more about the work that you're doing at the University of Pennsylvania? Yeah, so um, the one way would just be through our, our lab website. So our, our research lab is called the Sleep Neurobiology and Psychopathology Lab, or we are the SNAP lab at Penn. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn. That's, that's often a good way to reach out to me as well. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Phil. And we'll definitely have to have you on again in the future um, and look at the future of sleep and how that fits even more into the future of work. Sounds great. Thanks for yeah, having thank me Thank you, on. Phil. Thanks for helping. Uh, even someone who's, uh, I would say, naively familiar with uh, with sleep, the study of sleep, uh, this has been really rewarding and enriching. And really, I, I have a whole page of notes here. Uh, and questions. So um, really appreciate you being here and uh, please stay safe. Have a great uh, holiday season. Thank you. You do the same. Ira, that was absolutely fascinating take on, on sleep. We covered a lot in 45 minutes with Dr. Phil. Uh, we did. I've got uh, like a like a dozen new titles for this show, uh, including like <laughs> right. strategic napping, sleep is a family affair. <laughs> so, you know, really intriguing. And again, I, I, I will say that I'm na naively familiar. I'm probably at that conscious incompetence level of learning uh, that I know that I don't know a lot, uh, having been uh, the VP of, of a sleep center for a couple of years. And um, so, but yeah, there, there's just so much, but it, it really did hit me uh, how with, with the, I, I won't say it's a movement, but the trend or the awareness that organizations have to start considering employee well-being. We talk about purpose, have, aligning with their purpose, but just treating people better. And, you know, again, it's not only just younger generations, but, uh, you know, all the way through baby boomers is we need to be respected. And no, we're not going to, you know, we, we can't give you 24 hours a day and run on two hours of sleep a night. Um, so I think that awareness and some of the realistic, practical tips uh, of what companies can do, what leaders can do to at least just start nipping away at, at improving this. And one is, I, I love the idea, simple, uh, take a poll, you know, how many hours of sleep do you live in? Are, are, are you sleeping at night? And, and, and see where that is. And, and, you know, we, if you got, if you're collecting good data, um, you know, is it, is it impacting 
attendance? Is it impacting lateness? Is it impacting productivity? Is it impacting mistakes, errors, service? Um, you know, the, is the whole, we talk about the employee experience. How does it impact the employee experience? And there's no doubt it would. And one of the big takeaways for me, Ira, was, you know, we talked about the impact on remote work and remote work has opened up a slew of, even though it's been a learning curve for all of us, both for companies and for people, the opportunity that it presents here when it comes to sleep, it actually can improve it for a lot of people. Dr. Phil said, not everyone has a nine to five circadian rhythm that's ideal for them for their natural sleep patterns. And so if someone needs a 30 minute to an hour nap during the day, that that's much easier to do from home and can help with productivity. I think it's really exciting uh, to, to know that that is going to be one of the ways organizations can help with remote work of also helping improve sleep long term for people. But then the other thing he shared, too, I never thought of before is that I tend to think of my sleep as my sleep. But it is a family affair, as he mentioned. And that if you're not getting good sleep, it impacts other people. What other people are doing around you impacts your sleep schedule. And so, you know, just being, uh, you know, cognitively aware of that, that the things that you do and the things that the people around you do impact sleep and figuring out what those rules or routines can be to help everyone who is underneath the same house get their optimal sleep schedule in place is really critically important. So we want to thank you, Googleization Nation, for tuning in again today. Um, if you have not joined Googleization Nation, um, you can do so. Uh, you just go to GoogleizationNation.com, and at the top, there's going to be a button that says Join. We just drop that in the comments there of the live stream uh, where you can join. But uh, we have a lot of exciting things that are coming out um, as part of that membership, and so please join. Also, if you haven't subscribed and liked uh, the podcast on your favorite podcast platform, we ask that you please do that. But until next time, I'm Jason Cochran signing off. And I'm Ivor Wolf. Special thanks to Y Institute for partnering with us and sponsoring this episode. Thank you for being part of Googleization Nation. And until next week, don't let the shift hit your plans. Mm -hmm.